Good morning, everyone. Good morning to those of you joining us in person here today, and to, good morning to, or good afternoon or good evening, to those of you joining us online. Uh, and welcome to this session on Two-Eyed Seeing, Indigenous Values for Climate Resilient Water Management, which is being convened by the Australian Water Partnership, the University of Canberra, and the Stockholm International Water Institute. So my name is Llewellyn Martin. I'm an Assistant Secretary in the Australian Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water. And I'm a Kuma Kamilaroi woman from Australia's First Nations. And it gives me great pleasure to be your host for this session today. So I'll begin by acknowledging country. So some of you may know that this is a, a practice that that we have in Australia, which is based on our traditional customs and protocols. And it's a way that we, we honour and we pay respect to the First Nations people's ancient connections to land. And it's a way that we can connect with country when we're, we're visiting a new place. And it's also a way to remind ourselves in Australia that sovereignty of land was never ceded. So I acknowledge the Sami people and I pay my respect to the Sami people, their elders and their ancestors, and I thank them for their generosity in hosting us here. And I'll shortly invite Inga Albinson from the Stockholm Sami Association to say a few words to you today. Um, but firstly, I just wanted to kind of set the scene a bit for what we're gonna hear about today and what we're gonna learn about. So traditional knowledge, because of these deep connections to land that I was referring to, that First Nations peoples hold to, to land and to waters and to country. Over millennia, Indigenous knowledge systems and practices have developed to support holistic approaches to caring for country. And so when we talk about traditional knowledge, it consists of, of observations, of oral and written knowledge, of innovations, of practices, and of beliefs. And it comes through this thousands and thousands of years of cumulative knowledge from caring for country. Traditional knowledge promotes sustainability and the responsible stewardship of cultural and natural resources through the relationships between humans and their natural environments. And approaches are holistic. The health of country is understood as being reflected in and maintained through a complex web of interactions and dependencies. And this means that knowledge is location specific. So what's two-eyed two seeing all about then? So two-eyed seeing, or Edu Ardemunk, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, is a guiding principle that was articulated by Mikmore Elder Albert Marshall and according to the Institute for Integrative Science and Health, it refers to learning to see from one eye with the strengths of indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing, and the other eye with the strengths of Western knowledge and ways of knowing, and learning how to use both eyes for the benefit of all. Two-eyed seeing has also been described as the gift of multiple perspectives, and this really resonates with me because I think the opportunity that we have to combine the precious and priceless traditional knowledge collected over millennia with the power of Western scientific methods really is a gift to humanity as we confront our most pressing threats to our waters and our lands and our communities that climate change presents. So it's really pleasing to see that this is being increasingly recognised around the world and efforts are being made to increase First Nations people's participation in water management as a means to addressing contemporary and future issues. And this isn't always easy and too often we fail to benefit from a two-eyed seeing approach because our modern institutions and decision-making processes kind of lack the capacity to appropriately access and incorporate and apply traditional knowledge. So a challenge for all of you in the audience today as we listen to our First Nations experts is to consider how you can make space for traditional knowledge and approaches in your work 
in order to benefit from seeing with two eyes. So these are our very eminent experts who you'll be hearing from today. Um, but before I begin um, inviting them to the stage, I'll just firstly call um, Inga Albinson uh, to say a few words to us. Now, Inga is the president of the Stockholm Sami Association and was a very kind and generous host for First Nations participants at a pre-event on Sunday. So, Inga, please, can you uh, come on up? This seems to be to for tall people. <laughs> Can you hear me? I have always wanted to do this kind of introduction like uh, Llewellyn did because I've never heard it in Sweden. I have my part of my family in Australia, in Tasmania, my daughter and my grandchildren. So I, I learned it especially from Tassie and also from Australia, the way of sort of recognizing the land. And when we started to do the preparation for the, this uh, event to happen, I thought this would be something that I would be so, I've never heard it here exactly. So I will do it once, once again, just shortly. And it's a translation and an alteration from something, some people I've met in Australia. So it's not exactly the same. Some of the Swedish land is Sami land, and we don't own it, but we have the right to use it. We have the custodian of that land since immemorial time. We acknowledge the Sami people and, and uh, as the traditional and continuing custodians of the land, seas, mountains, forest, water, and rivers. We recognize the continuing connection to land and water and culture and pay our respect to the elders, the past, in past and present. And also we express gratitude to the knowledge that they have and that we will try to carry on. And we also acknowledge the merging younger leaders in our society. So hopefully we, talking about two-eyed seeings, um, we embrace the spirit of reconciliation, working towards more self-determination in our land, equity of outcome, and an equal voice for Sweden, Sweden's Sami people. And we also thank the land of Stockholm here, which is a, a town on water, an island, which is very suitable for this water week, I think. So we have had a couple of days and meeting uh, First Nations people from all over the world. So we have all already started this sharing of experiences and that has been so good. And it is also important that we carry that forward after this meeting. So we will continue to, in one way or another, to do some networking. For, for you who have, uh, haven't been with us these days, we could uh, very shortly tell when we talk about Sápmi, the Sámi land, it's not only Sweden, it's Norway, and it's Finland and the part of Russia the, in the Kola Peninsula as well. And we are not only reindeer herders, uh, we, are, we are doing all kinds of stuff, <laughs> hunting, fishing, and handicraft, and some of us are urban, we live in towns. So even Stockholm is a part of Sápmi since uh, I think at least uh, a third of all Sámi people in Sweden live in the Stockholm area. Um, I think the biggest uh, challenge we have for the moment being is the so-called green transition, which means, especially in the north, that there are a lot of mining, a lot of windcraft, and a lot of, uh, you know, looking for rare met metals, problems with water and all kinds of stuff. And that is really very difficult because uh, it seems sometimes that maybe Sami people are against the green transition, but we 
call it more the green colonization. Of course, we are not against uh, new practices and new uh, experiences and science about environmental issues, but it has to be together with the traditional knowledge. We have lived there, as many of you have lived at your places, and we have inherited a lot of uh, knowledge about how to, 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 to see and take care of the land, not only for this generation, but also for the generations to come. So that is the challenge for all of us, all of us I think. And, um, but it's a good way of uh, learning to listen to each other and learn from each other, and not just well about uh, on all the things that are not so good, but also think about and having the good examples of other places and say, how can we translate that into a Sami context or an Aboriginal context or the Maori or in Thailand or in Canada? So we, can, we have so much to learn from each other. And I think just these two days we had a pre-day. Okay. So Okay, well, welcome back everyone. For, for those of you online, we just had a, a short interlude there due to a fire alarm. Um, fortunately, uh, it was just an issue with some ovens in the kitchen, so everyone is safe and, and we're able to resume. So um, I'll just thank Inga Albinson, who was making um, her remarks or concluding her remarks before uh, we had our interruption and yeah, thank you Inga for being so generous in, in sharing your culture and in welcoming us here today. So we will move on now um, to Dr. Milika Sobi. So Dr. Sobi is an indigenous Fijian, an academic, a researcher and technical advisor and she's passionate about marine biology, freshwater systems and preserving indigenous cultural values. Milika, please come on up. What they fail to say is that I'm not so adept at uh, operating technology, so hopefully I'll get it right this time. Good. Can I just start by acknowledging the Sami people? You've uh, extended us wonderful hospitality for the, the last few days, and. Uh, I appreciate very much uh, your, your warm welcome to those of us from, from the other First Nations. I'd also like to acknowledge two people that helped me with this piece of research. Um, one I consider a national treasure from Fiji. She's an 84-year-old lady who's just finished what I call the Bible of healing plants of Fiji, Mrs. Suliana Siwatimbao. She's 84, published this wonderful book, and she uh, was very obliging with all my questions about uh, indicator species of, of water presence. The other gentleman I'd like to acknowledge at the start of my uh, talk is Mr. Simeone Sebundrendre, who is also very knowledgeable on indigenous, uh, especially our history. But if I can just formally introduce myself, my name is Milika Sobi. Um, I'm from the clan of Rarakavindi, the tribe of Madokawa, from the Bunua Otambanivorno, from the province of Nandroganda Bossa in the Fiji Islands. Now, I'd like to start just by giving you a bit of an introduction on the spiritual significance of fresh water and water bodies in indigenous Fijian culture. And there's three levels of spiritual significance to water bodies. At the first level, practically every tribe in Fiji has totems, three totems in total. There's usually a sky totem, a tree totem, and a water totem. So for my clan, our sky totem is the peregrine falcon, which we call the Nganiwachu. Our tree totem is this one, the Tahitian chestnut tree, and that's the Latin name there, um, and it, we call in Fijian the ibi tree. And then our water totem 
is the freshwater gobi because my village is on the banks of the Singataka River. And so our water totem is the gobi fish, which we call the uh, ikanibachu. Now these totems basically is, is an indigenous framing of the, the custodianship of the natural environment. And every tribe in Fiji has all three totems. They're not entirely unique. Some tribes share the same totem trees, but uh, by and large, everyone has these three totems. At the next level of spiritual significance of freshwater bodies is the installation of a, a chief. When a chief is traditionally installed, there's a ritualistic bath, or we call a sili. And this happens after he's been in confinement away from the public eye for four days. And this ritual bath takes place at a sacred pool or pond in the instance of, of inland tribes or, yeah, inland tribes. And if it's a coastal chief, he will take this ritualistic bath or sili in the sea. And this is really a, a symbolic transformation from being a mere human to one that's imbued with leadership mana. So that ritual bath at the end of confinement symbolizes him, his emergence of the newly born chief imbued with mana and the blessings of his people to rule the tribe's sky, earth, and water domain. At a deeper spiritual level, these bodies of water, like the one on this first slide, this is the site of our old village. So we call it Kormakawa. And the water that's often found in these old village sites are traditionally thought to be tower or inhabited by children that are thought to have been, uh, that died shortly after birth. And so they're called lubeniwai or water babies. And they are the source of inspiration for choreographers, for matriarchs who compose our traditional poems or wudu or our traditional dances or meke. The inspiration is taken from these water bodies. And, um, these water bodies are usually held with in very high um, respect, and uh, they're approached by the living with reverential silence, as well as the groves, the, or the tree groves that surround these pools. They often render the same reverence. Now, in Fiji, there have also been occurrences of healing waters. There's a very famous river, River um, Oisali, Oisili River, where children with speech impediments are taken to drink from that river. And by all accounts, they are cured of those speech impediments. There's another river in Dawasamu that cures other um, you know, disabilities and, and ailments. But in thinking of how to present this topic, I'll just, I just find this tree so majestic, which is why I went a bit overboard with the, with the photographs. But this is our totem tree. Don't you think it's majestic? I do. So in thinking of how to present this topic, I initially thought of demonstrating how a particular area in Fiji managed their water traditionally. But I decided to make a case for totemic plants as being a case study in water management. I looked at plant indicators of water presence by, and interviewed the legendary Mrs. Siwati Mbao, who's 84 years old, and she gave me a list of trees or plants that are thought or, or known to be present wherever there's a water source. And this is just a sample of the, the list of trees she gave me. Yeah, it's not exhaustive. But the ticks that you find next to some of those Latin names are actually the trees that are totems of certain clans. And I found in going through the to total list that she gave me that some 80% of these water indicator plants are also totems. So that's an interesting correlation. Because in the past, these totem trees were always just associated with food security. But what I propose from this little bit of research that we've done is perhaps they're also an indicator or, or, you know, for water security and not just food security. So I then went to um, and, and think about it, this is of great significance given the impacts of climate change that we're now facing in the islands to have these indicator plans. 
in uh, interviewing elders about traditional water sources, I was then taken to see the old water source for the village of VCC. Now, VCC probably means nothing to you, but this village is of historical importance because it is at the site where the first Fijians landed uh, thousands of years ago. And this is their traditional water source that is said to never run dry. It is protected by this tree, which is the rain tree, which is another totemic plant for certain clans in Fiji. So I was very privileged to be taken there by uh, one of the high chiefs of the village. And other water sources that I show here, or other indicator plants, are ones that the older Fijians know there are always indicators that water is underground. Many of the older Fijians also know of coastal ponds. So near the coastline, you will find freshwater ponds. And in those freshwater ponds, you will have trees like Rhizophora that are growing there. You will have trees like Brugira, Gymnoriza that are also growing there. So one of the, the findings that we thought was pretty significant in doing this research was that Totem plants certainly serve for water security. Now, I thought I would just tell you a little bit about the, the legal protection of these things because, sorry. The government of Fiji at the moment is extremely proactive in preserving traditional knowledge. And the legal protection of old village sites like the one that I showed you of our village sites legal protection of such areas comes under the Fiji Museum's ambit. And at the moment, on their database, the Fiji Museum, Fiji Museum holds more than 2,000 sites that include old village sites, includes caves, includes fortifications, but they have a database of some 2,000 sites of national significance. And as I mentioned, this government has been very proactive. There's a bill called the Traditional Knowledge and Expression of Culture Bill. Traditional, so we basically just refer to it as TKEC, Traditional Knowledge and Expression of Culture Bill. It's taken some 20 years in the drafting. But this bill has been deliberately introduced to um, protect traditional knowledge systems from misappropriation. And this came about because of the misuse of um, the Fiji Airways logo by some, I believe, some foreign company. And so this bill will allow um, traditional people to seek legal redress around uh, the misuse of their traditional knowledge, their traditional totems, and their designs. And as part of the form development of this bill, cultural mapping has seen an exhaustive part of this exercise, and they've mapped intangible cultural heritage or knowledge systems from the more than 1,000 villages in the 14 provinces to date. So they've got on their database more than uh, yeah, knowledge systems from the more than 1,000 villages in Fiji. And so this bill will hopefully be enacted into law sometime soon. Like I told you, it's been a long time in the making, but it's extremely encouraging when you have a government that is very proactive in preserving traditional knowledge. I believe my time is up. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Milika. Um, now I'd like to invite uh, up to the stage Sung Rawi Suwirakan. So Sung belongs to the Taiyai or Shan from Chiang Mai, Northern Thailand. She's a member of the Shan Women's Action Network, the Indigenous Women's Network of Thailand and Network of Indigenous Women in Asia. Welcome um, Sung. Thank you. Thank you for AWP that uh, give me opportunity to share about indigenous uh, knowledge uh, regarding to water governance in Thailand. Yes, um, I come from uh, Cook River Basin. It's uh, 285 kilometers long. 
uh, along Gok River, there are 14 indigenous people, be, uh, group that are our, each group have our own unique and tradition and way of life connect to the water and the river. And today I'm going to share about Chan. And for the uh, indigenous people uh, along Gok River, Gok River is like our school and the uh, uh, kitchen and the transportation route. Uh, from 18, uh, uh, 1824 to 1948, during the Burmese was under British colonial rule, the main business of the northern part of Thailand was export the thick wood to overseas country. Gok River is uh, served as the primary route to deliver thick wood to the Mekong River. You can see from the picture that uh, comparing location uh, 1952 and 2002, it took us more than seven decades uh, to uh, recover rainforest. This is uh, crucial for, uh, is because it's our watershed. The community has taken over then to take care of this forest more than over uh, 40 years. We have regulation issued by the board of directors, uh, consisting of the both men and women to ensure the sustainable use of uh, commercial forests. We believe that uh, the water from the mountain is an alternative source of clean water of daily use and consumption. To preserve the watershed forest, Chan people actively manage the environment by uh, selectively cutting tree to preserve the watershed forest. Specifically, uh, when we cutting bamboo shoot, we ensure to cut only the measure stock for use, leaving the next generation to continue growing. This practice ensure sustainability and prevent uh, overexploitation of our ancestral teaching. Bamboo is considered an indicator of the forest fertility by the Chan people. Indigenous community protect water source by planting for uh, four layers of the tree. The first layer consists, uh, the first layer is uh, consists of the moist tree, which is prevents uh, erosion and hold the soils on the riverbank. The second layer is the include large uh, chrysanthemum plant uh, um, along the bank. The plants can survive even when submerged in uh, water for a month. Indigenous people are uh, aware that the moisty root provide a habitat of the crustacean, fish, crab, and other animals. The third layer consists of different types of bamboo, which we use for food and uh, housing. A different type of bamboo can decay of the level of the forest moisturization. For example, bamboo for human and animal food uh, grow not far from the river because it requests moisturized soils for bamboo to produce young sprout more quickly. However, the bamboo grow in high altitude is good for construction. Indigenous people know how to process bamboo, young sprout, and preserve them for off-season consumption. Consumption, bamboo sprout are also preserved by a white ball at their food. In addition, bamboo can be used for produce different farm too. Moreover, a variety of the mushroom can be found in the bamboo forest. But if seasonal bamboo disappear from the bamboo forest, it would increase the same source of climate change. Whereas, uh, which are bamboo constructor build uh, across river are the source of water and food. Indigenous people have passed the knowledge about wheel construction from generation to, to generation. When we clear forest path or cut down tree, it is not for commercial purpose, but it creates 
habitat and maintain a balance between people and forest. Uh, moreover, Thai people have um, uh, maintained their belief and reassure relate to water uh, from birth to death. We worship that uh, the gradient of watershed that uh, protects the forest, ensuring a perpetual supply of food and water. The designated watershed forest area prevents anyone from daring to cut tree or hunt anymore, making a perpetual region. There is also a forest ordination ritual uh, where the current people tie the uh, yellow rope around the tree, uh, symbolizing an ordination of Buddhist monk. When a new baby is born it, it, to its mother, her or his uh, umbilical cord shall be placed in the bamboo container and hang on a healthy tree. This customary practice implies that the soul of baby and the tree are uh, intertwined and the tree cannot be cut anymore. Why we try to uh, care of the forest and the water, several climate changes has uh, caused some of our native vegetation to disappear. To adapt to uh, this changing environment, our indigenous farmers have had to modify their cultivation practice and adapt plants a variety that are better suit to changing climate. However, for indigenous people, the impact of climate change period is the comparison to the negative if, uh, effect uh, of the government and the private development project. For example, like um, there are 30 sand mining operations along Gok River, exporting sand for the construction industry. This, peop uh, this project owned by influential people, such as a member of parliament, negatively affect uh, the environment and biodiversity. In my local area, uh, many people have uh, lost their land along the river due to the lack of the documentation. This has uh, forced young people to seek jobs in the city because they can no longer continue their farmer's life. There is also a coal mining project in the Upper Cook River, Chan State in Burma, owned by military company. This project has resource to force relocation of a number of the community, and some people have become illegal migrants to Thailand. There, there's a, a challenge we are facing. Development projects often benefit a small group of people while causing harm to the environment, aquatic life, and biodiversity. Once again, we are not opposed to development policy, but we believe it would be beneficial if the corporate uh, scientific knowledge and experience of indigenous people at a national and global level during discussion and decision-making process. We understand ourselves and our surrounding better than others else. For us, indigenous, water and forest are part of our life. When we say protect river, protect forest, we are ultimately striving to protect our people and life of others. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, um, Sang. Now, Next up, um, moving back to the Pacific, I'd like to invite Erina Watine to the stage. So Erina from Waikato, Aotearoa, is the Chief Scientist Maori for the New Zealand Biological Heritage Science Challenge and is also one of five Crown appointed board representatives for the Waikato River Authority. Welcome, Erina.
Well, morena everyone. Thank you for joining our session um, in person and online. Um, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the Indigenous people of these lands, the Sami. It was fantastic to spend time with you all on Sunday along with the other Indigenous groups. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge the other panellists here this morning as well um, and Australian Water Partnership for um, supporting uh, my attendance today. Thank you very much. And last but not least, I also wanted to make a quick shout out to my whanaunga from Aotearoa who are also here. Uh, we have seven um, up and coming leaders um, from, from my country. Um, so if you want to know about biodiversity, climate change, water or the environment, hit them up in the break. I'm sure they'll be um, happy to talk to you. Okay, let's get on. Ko Taupiri te maunga. Taupiri is my mountain. Ko Waikato te awa. Waikato is my river. So the Waikato River is the longest river in Aotearoa at 425 kilometres and it has a catchment area of almost 14,000 square um, kilometres. It's also under a co-governance arrangement between the five river tribes and the New Zealand um, government. I can't talk about that too much today but on Thursday at 2pm there's a session around governance and I'll talk more about the co-governance arrangements. Um, okay. Ko Waikato te iwi, so I belong to the Waikato tribe. I'm one of 80, oh, it's 80,000 now not 77, 80,000 registered tribal members um, and we have 68 marae and my marae is Te Papa Warotu. Our tribe is based in the um, North Island uh, of New Zealand, it's pretty much halfway around the world from here. <laughs> uh, Irina Ho, so my name is Irina, and these are my field assistants. They also double as my kids. Um, <laughs> so we have Tarui on the left, he's 17, Maya in the middle, 14, and Romati, 24, on um, this side. And they've been helping me since they could walk. <laughs> And in terms of my presentation today, uh, I just wanted to share a little bit of our journey. Um, it's a sovereignty piece, it's a self-determination piece, uh, and it talks about four river tribes and three sub-tribes coming together, uniting to manage tuna or freshwater eels uh, in our catchment. In this case, we didn't just want to sit at the table in terms of decision making, we made our own table and bought our own seats. So just in terms of a bit of background, tuna or freshwater eels are a taonga or treasured species for, for our people. Um, we didn't have um, reindeer or kangaroos like my cousins, to, so we had to rely on freshwater eels for sustenance. Um, and actually our survival uh, of our tupuna or our ancestors is pretty much reliant on um, accessing these, these freshwater um, eels. In terms of the current state of tuna though, um, they're in decline. Um, we have three species in our country. We have the longfin tuna, which is endemic, and its status is at risk in decline. It's Department of Conservation status. And there are a number of impacts affecting our tuna populations. So there, there's over-harvesting, there's been um, loss of habitat, there's disease, there's climate change. Um, these have all impacted in terms of the numbers of our, of our Taonga species. I'm rushing because we've only got 10 minutes. Um, so in terms of, in 2022, at the beginning of 2022, one of the river iwi reached out to the others. They said, hey, let's have a conversation and see if we want to kind of unite and work together in terms of looking after tuna in our catchment. Um, and through a process of wānanga, which are like workshops, and site visits, um, they decided unanimously that yes, they did want to work together. And so we went through a process of identifying what their priorities were. So this was initiated by iwi themselves, it wasn't something that was imposed. And it, originally there were about 30 or 40 <laughs> kind of um, ideas that were put on the table and we were like, yeah, that's, we're not going to be able to achieve that. So let's just narrow it down and look at the top four. So this is what the group came up with. This is where they landed. Um, and the number one priority for the group was to take over the trap and transfer program. So um, at Karapiro. So Karapiro is one of eight hydro dams along our river. And when the baby eels come in or the baby tuna come in, they come up the river from the ocean and they hit the dam and they can't go any further. So about 30 years ago, um, some traps were put in place at this dam at Karapiro. And it had been, this program had been run um, predominantly by the commercial eel fishers 
um, and they, they, their goal was to take the baby eels and put them into the upper hydro lakes so that they could go back and harvest them later. So it was all about sustaining the industry, um, which wasn't really in alignment with the values of the river iwi uh, along, along the river. <coughs> So in order to take it from an aspiration to implementation, there were a number of uh, kind of things that we needed to do. We needed to find resourcing. We needed to get authorization. So the Ministry for Primary Industries authorised the commercial fishers to do this work, but um, their permit was running out. And so um, when it came up for renewal, uh, all of the river iwi opposed its renewal, and then it kind of it didn't get renewed. So then that provided the space for river iwi to come in and take over this program. And so we did that, but we also went back to the Ministry of Primary Industries and said, um, we're not gonna, we don't need a permit from you guys, we're gonna authorise it under our own river settlement. And so um, I wrote the permit and it got signed off by Te Ranga's boss, Taipu Paki, at Waikato Tainui. So that's how that um, went down. Um, and then we needed to hire two kaitiaki, or two workers who were working on behalf of the collective who did the day-to-day -day work. Um, and then we needed to make sure they had all the health and safety training um, and access to the dam as well. This is a bit about our process. And thanks to Tamoko and Wai who made this. So these are some of the quotes from people that were... <laughs> that was Tamoko who made that. These are some of the quotes for some of the people who were at the release site. So we were involved in all of the decision making all the way along. We, we authorised it, we decided where the tuna would go, we worked with the people on the ground, and when the releases happened, um, they took over the cultural practices when those fish were being released. So um, there were like karanga or waiata, like different practices, even haka when these um, tuna were being released into the waterways. And it was actually quite an emotional thing for a lot of people um, being there and being able to give back to our river. And so the, another key point of difference is we didn't put them all uh, in the upstream, like, like previously we put them in other parts of our catchment as well as determined by our people, which was really cool. Um, and in the first year, we moved 500,000 um, baby eels. And that happened in this, December to March this year, so that was our first um, attempt at it, and we're really um, happy with how that went. And yeah, you can read the quotes. Everyone was really um, um, pleased to be a part of it. Just quickly, in terms of some of the impact, we found it quite transformational for us. Um, it reconnected people to place. 
Um, there was an intergenerational transfer of knowledge, so there were like grandparents. We had two schools turn up one day. Um, the, uh, yeah. And so um, it was an ability for us to practice as kaitiaki. Uh, as I mentioned, we were using our ceremonies, our beliefs, and our practices while doing this work and looking after our Tonga species. It was also spiritually uplifting. Many um, people that were present kind of felt uh, the wairua of the moment or, the, or being uplifted. Um, and also it was ecologically important for the tuna because previously, as soon as they've been put up above the dam, that's pretty much it. There's no way for them to get back down. So the ones that we were able to put in other locations will at least have a chance of going back out to sea to spawn and continue the cycle. It's values based, it was based on our values, and it is mana whakahaere in practice, which is about the river iwi's authority, rights and control to make decisions in their catchment um, in their way. Oh, and just a couple of key messages. So there's growing recognition that there are other ways of knowing, being and doing. There's also a growing body of examples of indigenous-led indigenous approaches to biodiversity and water management. Um, and from our perspective, there were some incredible outcomes um, from this for us. Um, and just, well, this is what worked for us. So some tips that you can take or not take, but in terms of working differently, it's about connecting, listening, collaborating, co-creating, um, resource people to do the mahi and empower them and let them go. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Erina. That was a great presentation. And thanks for the sharing the video as well. It was really, really good. Um, <laughs> cute. Uh, oops. OK, so now um, moving around to, or, uh, to Australia, uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Bradley Mogridge. So Brad uh, is a proud Camillo Mo Murray. He's an environmental hydrologist and associate professor in Indigenous water science at the University of Canberra in Australia. Come on up, Brad. Yeah, I'm everyone. Uh, this is uh, my country and my people, and, and I acknowledge Sami for their hospitality and, and generosity for hosting us and sharing their culture and their information and knowledge with us um, for this time. And also, yeah, we were lucky to engage with you last year, and it's been an absolute honour. So this is who I am. Um, the reason I do what I do is for the young ones and the, the ones that are past. Uh, the young ones, not so young now, the, the boy's 19 with a big fat hairy mullet <laughs> and the daughter's just about to turn 16 and just about to get her L's, her learner's permit, so scary times. <laughs> um, what I'll talk about is uh, how first people's knowledge, values and practices can be engaged with to inform water planning and resilience, develop a framework and methodology for engaging with first peoples and support resilient water management on-country engagement through face-to-face -face interviews, even through COVID was tough, two years I lost through this research, and then it was under La Nina, so it was underwater for a couple of years as well. So some really challenging times to get out there. Um, and then identifying a set of cultural values and sites that require water that don't get water anymore. So it's using traditional knowledge to identify that. So for us, water is a, is a key part of who we are. It's in our songs, our dances, our dreaming stories, and of course our art. So Aboriginal art is very much, because we're a dry continent, water is a, is a key part of, of our connection. So our stories, our knowledge is not myth and legend, so in the realm of fiction. So I want to try and get back how our old people knew water, reconnect with it, um, tell our stories our way, because I got tired of hearing non-Indigenous people tell our stories. Uh, build in re indigenous research methodologies, uh, rights and values of water, so decolonise water is, is our challenge, and then culturally validate our knowledge, not scientifically, culturally validate our knowledge. Um, and then, yeah, that's one of my totems, Yaba Morelia spilata, the carpet snake, and that's through, it's through my grandparents. And that's sort of where our totemic system was lost at that point. So this is where I did my study. Uh, it's in northwest New South Wales on the eastern seaboard. That's our country there. It's a fair chunk of New South Wales and up into Queensland. 
and the Guaida wetlands is within that and it's, it's a Ramsar listed site and it's also very significant. So I'll tell you a bit about our challenges for that. It's, it's a state conservation area. It'll never be a national park because there's potentially coal seam gas under it. So we're restricted by that with our obviously access. We still don't have the keys to our country. Um, but some of that land is coming back into public ownership, so that gives us access. So it's really only, it was 9.7% 9 .7 in, um, in public hands, so National Parks has, a, has, has the keys to our country at the moment. Uh, so it's originally, you know, it was more than 100,000 hectares, and a lot of that was all private land. So private, private land that, that now public land... Uh, public agencies are now buying back that land to, to build in because obviously there's Ramsar, there's biological and ecological, but the cultural aspect is still unknown. So when you think about that, our mob is 160 years of being locked out. So we've lost all those generations of connection. So what I tried to do with my methodology was shift the paradigm away from Kimilaroi people being the researched to me becoming a researcher for them. Um, so I'm still learning every time I go on country and how I relate to it. It's, it's, it's always a journey that I'm on and, and reconnecting with country is very special. So that word rematriate water and decolonise water is very important. So a lot of our stories are women's stories, especially on our country and especially the groundwaters. Being a hydrogeologist, I need to be very careful about some of the places I, I go to or, can, or can't go to, I suppose. And, um, so getting our women to, 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 to tell their stories and reconnect with these places. And, you know, sometimes I'm not allowed to, the, to go to these places. And I suppose it's our knowledge and methods, we are evolving with the, the, and adapting to these changes. Time for mitigation is over. We have to adapt now. Um, and obviously trying to fill the void of water management with Camilleroy science. Um, so the, the, this is sort of my, my mantra, you know, by Camilleroy, with Camilleroy, for Camilleroy. And there's a little article there I did around research methodologies. So Camilleroy people were interviewed on country when I could get access. So I'm about 900 kilometres away from my land, and so it's a, it's a, it's a fair trek to get there. Um, there was a generic set of survey questions, but a lot of them just went out the door and we just sat by the fire and yarn. So it was, it was pretty special. And so what I found that there's a lot of Camilleroy language in this, in this landscape taken up by non-Indigenous people to, to name their road or name their, name their property by Camilleroy words. So that's, I think that's a common thing across Australia. Um, and the Guaida wetlands where I did my study is yet to have an extensive cultural heritage, heritage survey. So we, to a point, we don't really know what's, what's left uh, with regard to agriculture. It was mainly agriculture, so grazing and also irrigated agriculture, so like things like cotton. Um, and climate change, we can already see it. Even through my visits over the last 10 years, of, you know, you see climate change impacting. So this was October 2020, one of our biggest waterholes, the Gingham waterhole, and looking, looking magnificent, and this was two months later bone dry. So you can sort of see the, the white, um, it's a, a boom to collect water hyacinth, uh, an exotic um, and pretty bad weed. So that's my son walking across that water hole. So I suppose it, we're, we're feeling it right now. So what I found was that there's a contingency allowance for the environment in the water plan and we'd potentially been offered, that's purely for ecological outcomes, and we're looking to build that into, to, to get cultural outcomes, to deliver some of these, some of this water for cultural outcomes rather than just ecological. Um, there are some places that used to get regular water, and now they don't. Um, and there, there's a lot of, we don't have a say in when and where water's delivered. And then, because it's flat country, you only need to build a small mound to divert water away, those flood waters away. So a lot of our water is not getting to the places that, that should be there. So what I used as part of this research was identify cultural indicators and also cultural values that were connected to, to sites in this space. Um, and yeah, even non-Indigenous people had connections to this place. So they, you know, aesthetics, you know, it was nice to look at, but also ducks for hunting back in the old days. So yeah, it even got the name Duck Lagoon from the local um, uh, people from there. And then 
we found a large lagoon, and it was called Taramungri, uh, in old, old uh, cadaster maps. Um, and it needs regular warding. And there, there's a red sand ridge uh, that runs through the centre of that. And there's obviously a lot of, um, there's a lot of cultural species in this sand ridge. So definitely these plants were moved and, and translocated from other parts of country. So when the country's in flood, they have all the resources they need to access. Uh, this, this was the old, old map we found um, that had Taramungri. Um, it was called, well, there's a dam there, but that dam's no longer there, but the, the lagoon's still there. And that, after La Nina in 2022, we got a brief window to get out there because it's black soils and you bog up to your axles if you go out there when it's wet. So we got a small window and we, we saw Taramungri in its all its glory, which was uh, magnificent to see. So this is my journey as well. Um, so I suppose it's... a uh, Burugu is our creation, so it's knowing who you are and where you're from. And yeah, linked to that is, is, is the sky camp where the old people go to when they pass on. Ceremony is Bura, uh, law is our began, and a song is Yugu, and story is our Durumba Li. And then Winangali is to hear, to listen. That's knowing your story, listen to country, listen to people. And as I showed earlier, my, my carpet snake totem, um, speak the language and care for country. So that's Mother Earth is, is Gunima and Galamali is, is caring for her. And then Wuri is to give, buy for with Kamilaroi, tell our stories our way. And I suppose this was me, you know, that's all the aspects of country, you know, water is Gali, wind is Miyara, uh, fire is we, and we had a smoking oven earlier. Hopefully no, there was no we. <laughs> um, and, and uh, we have country as well, which is Walla Bay. And so I suppose that is my journey. You know, this is me. This is, uh, and then it's my evolution of my beard through COVID. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone. <laughs> great. Thank you so much, Brad. Um, and it was great to see great to see these photos of these little field assistants as well popping up in presentations too. Um, okay, so next up um, we have Michelle Hobbs. So Michelle is a descendant of the Bidjara and Dungari peoples. She is a freshwater woman and an aquatic ecologist and associate lecturer at Griffith University. So please welcome Michelle to the stage. Morning everyone. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Sami people of the lands that we're on and acknowledge their custodianship and their care of these lands and waters and thank them for welcoming us into their place. I'd also like to acknowledge my own ancestors, Bidra and Dungari. So we have a long history of water management in Australia, um, but there is this pervasive and largely unacknowledged assumption that Australia, in Australia, uh, before Europeans arrived, everything was in some kind of magical, natural state and everything was perfect. And I guess you could look at it like that. Um, but it ends up giving us this kind of blind spot um, when we assume that before Europeans arrived, everything was just as it was without human influence. Uh, and so I'm gonna share with you today um, some of my observations, a fairly high level overview of um, some of my observations from working in water quality policy in government, in environmental consulting and in research now. Um, just how this blind spot sort of plays out in the way that we um, approach water management in Australia. Uh, so when we, um, when we ignore the fact that Aboriginal people in Australia have been managing water places, we're ignoring um, the 65,000 years of human occupation in mainland Australia. And just to give you a couple of sort of concrete examples of Aboriginal water management, and these are not top secret, these are not hard examples to find, they're very much well published, well researched and in the public domain. So the first one is the Badijawa people of the Kimberley region. 
Uh, they manage their wetlands in a particular way so that uh, they improve water quality for longer at the end of the wet season. So what they do is they get in there and they remove excess vegetation from the wetlands to improve the oxygenation of the water. And they also undertake a bit of mangrove clearing to improve the flow of the water out of the wetland at the end of the wet season so the water flows for longer and stays healthier for longer. And that is specifically for the purpose of improving water quality for drinking and for, for human use and for the benefit of the wetland itself. Another example, um, the picture on the right here, is a place called Budge Bim in Victoria in the south of Australia. And the Gunjamara people established thousands and thousands of square kilometres of aquaculture systems to increase freshwater eel productivity. So it's a, it's a huge, huge expanse of area of these interconnected shallow channels where eels could proliferate um, in a really productive way to enhance the, the food supplies um, and boost the ecosystems in that area. So academic and Yaman Bidjara woman, Marcia Langton, describes this situation as yet another form of colonisation and exploitation to ignore that our landscapes are actually biocultural landscapes. They inherently involve people. Um, these landscapes have been created and shaped by people over millennia into productive and livable ecosystems. So as Aboriginal people, we see rivers as living beings, inseparable from the land and the sky. You can't separate the water from the riverbed and from the land around it. But our legislation separates all of that. Um, water has been turned into a commodity, you have to buy licences to purchase water and it is managed completely separately from the way that the land and everything else is managed. And it hasn't served rivers well. When you talk about river health it's, it's kind of one of those fuzzy terms, it kind of depends who you ask and, and what their values are. Um, but in the days before water treatment as we know it today, the river water had to be good enough to drink, that was the goal. And in a lot of women's places in some areas, it also had to be good enough to give birth in. And that's a cultural right that we pretty much don't have access to anymore. So to go to the Murray-Darling Basin, which is one of the biggest river basins, uh, well, the biggest river basin in Australia, um, there's a record in one of the explorer's diaries, Thomas Mitchell, in 1835 on the Darling River, which describes the river as being, the water being beautifully transparent the bottom was visible at great depths, showing large fishes in shoals floating like birds in midair. And Uncle Badger Bates, a Barkanji man, talks about the ribbon weed that used to grow in the clear waters of the Barker River. But what we see now in the Darling, and that's the picture on the left, that's the Darling River there. What we see now is that the water is never clear. There are no water plants, there's an overallocation of water, there's land clearing, there's cattle impacts, weeds, increasing droughts. This photo was at the end of the last drought in 2019. And all of this leads to reduced river health. And there's also this collective amnesia, forgetting what the river used to be like. In living memory, yes, the river's always been brown and dirty, but you go back further than that and the river was completely different, it was clear. So our scientific records are also short. They only extend back 50, 100, 150 years, and that's what all of our management is based on. But Indigenous memories are long, really long, and uh, are based on observations that have been handed down over thousands of years. So the point that I wanted to make in terms of climate change is that research shows that looking after catchment and river health can actually help with the big things like droughts, floods, climate change. When you have really good vegetation cover in your catchment, it reduces evaporation, increases groundwater recharge. The riparian zones along the river edges are really key for reducing temperatures, stabilising banks, providing habitat. Protecting or emulating natural flows in rivers is really particularly important for rivers and using Aboriginal knowledges to inform environmental cultural flows really maintains biodiversity and recharges wetlands. And looking after these things gives us a much better shot at anticipating some of the things that we're expecting to happen during climate change, such as extended drought, 
and those sorts of things, and, and flood mitigation as well. So the point is we have to prioritise looking after catchment health to be able to adapt to climate change and Indigenous knowledges are really key in providing that knowledge and that on-ground, ongoing care for country. So river health is an important part of Aboriginal cultural heritage and when I talk about cultural heritage, usually we are restricted to talking about physical artefacts uh, such as, you know, old tools and scar trees and physical things, but the cultural heritage also includes the living landscape itself. And I see Indigenous knowledges as contributing in two key ways to river management. The first one is just priorities, putting the health of the river first, putting the well-being of the river first, letting it flow, letting it be healthy, because we can't survive without the water sources being healthy. And the second one is traditional ecological knowledge or biocultural knowledge or however you want to put it, those observations that are passed down over generations. However, those observations are often inseparable from culture. You can't necessarily take all of that information out of its cultural context because it loses meaning and it's not appropriate to use it in that way. So it's really important to enable Indigenous people to maintain control of their knowledge and use it in ways that they see as appropriate. So in terms of what is happening now in Australia, in, in terms of two-eyed seeing, we are taking small steps in, make, in making use of both Indigenous and Western science in water quality. And governments are getting better at engaging Aboriginal people to consider values and uses of water in management plans but these still separate the management of water quality from water quantity. So one example that I wanted to share with you was, um, in Australia, we use something called the Australian New Zealand Water Quality Guidelines. And this is a substantial data set of, I guess, 100, 200 years of water quality data from Australia and New Zealand. And this is used um, by government and by um, mining proponents uh, to set local water quality guidelines and objectives, um, local, water, local guidelines but also um, more large scale guidelines. And in a regulatory context this is used, um, it's relevant to drinking water and also ecosystem health targets. Um, however, there is also a fantastic tool that has been developed um, by some of my colleagues, Brad Mogridge and I think Phil was involved as well, in um, it's a tool that highlights and upholds the spiritual and cultural values in, um, in the context of deriving local water quality guidelines. So deriving guidelines that um, uphold those cultural and spiritual values instead of just relying on the scientific data. But to our knowledge, uh, this tool hasn't been used very widely. And I see one of the reasons for that is because policy doesn't demand that it be used. Um, when it comes to regulation policy in mining, the only thing that they need to consider is cultural heritage. So we get shoehorned into only being able to talk about those physical cultural artefacts and not being able to have a seat at the table in setting environmental targets for our waters. So Indigenous people need to be considered experts in the knowledge that they hold and not just consulted, but be at the table in making decisions. So to sum up, we know that relationships and having a holistic um, viewpoint and approach to managing rivers is really critical to river health. And Indigenous knowledges on river health extend back thousands of years, and this could be potentially incredibly useful when it comes to adapting to a changing climate. We've seen changes in climate happen before. And Indigenous knowledges prioritise the well-being of the river and the sacred water first, because it is so important. If you don't have water, you have nothing. And this is going to be key in climate resilience moving forward. And there are key gaps in policy that we need to close. So moving forward from just engagement to having Indigenous experts at the table in making those decisions. And stronger policy that d demands that Indigenous values are actually protected and are part of the objectives and not just written down and documented and kept on file. 
So we need regulation that supports Indigenous people to participate in environmental management. Thank you so much, Michelle. And please um, just join me in thanking once again all of our panellists. So now um, we have some time for questions and answers. We've got about 15, 20, 15, 20 minutes, um, which is great. So for those of you online, feel free to pop a question in the chat. And for those of you in the room, we'll have some um, mics going around. And perhaps I'll just offer a few of my own reflections, if I may, on, on that, just while you're thinking of your questions. So I think, you know, what I would take away from those presentations is that um, the traditional knowledge that, that we heard about today um, about waterways and about natural environment is obviously very, very deeply entwined with culture. The other thing I observed that was common amongst the presentations is that the knowledge holders that we heard from hold their knowledge as part of their nation and part of their community and, and that knowledge has been received through generations. We heard them talk about the conversations that they had with their elders um, as part of their projects. I don't, I don't think we heard anyone talk about taking a water plant or a water species and going off and studying it in a lab and, and then presenting their findings on that. I think that's significant. Um, and I think the other thing that we can take away from these presentations is that the process of decolonization of the broader environment in which these traditional knowledge systems sit is really only beginning and has a very long way to go. And so I think these perhaps are, are useful things to keep in mind as we begin to think about how we might approach two-eyed seeing. Okay, so with that, I'll open it up to questions. Um, does anyone... Oh, we have a question there from, from Inga. Hello, I'm Inge Prisco of the Sami Association in Stockholm. Now I'm not going to re relate to any Sami issue, but today there is a rush for restoring wetlands uh, in Sweden and probably Norway and, and Finland and Russia as well. And I hear reports on that in nor north of uh, our country, including Sápmi, uh, our wetland projects are not giving the expected results a diminishing of uh, methane, uh, methane fumes. Uh, so I just wonder, uh, it would be uh, spectacular if uh, we could have a second opinion from, from your uh, restoration projects on, on restored wetlands. Thank you. Uh, you think that would be possible? What, what are the success fact factors in um, restoring wetlands? And what are the failures uh, you, you, you have seen in your projects? Would anyone like to take on that one from our panellists about success fa factors for restoring wetlands? Michelle? Yep. Um, thank you for the question. And it's probably a really difficult one to answer. Um, from my understanding, like there's so much research into restoring wetlands and other ecosystems all around the world. And the recurring theme that I keep hearing is that every situation is different um, because, you know, the relationships between the different organisms in each, each place is going to be inherently different. So I think that's where it comes back to trial and error and trying again and really observing what is happening in each particular wetland. And that's where local knowledge is so important because each piece of land has completely different uh, relationships and operates in a different way, which is why Indigenous knowledge is so valuable because it's place-based, it's based in that, in that area. So I probably can't comment too much more, but that's what I've got. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Yeah. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the uh, rehabilitation is through adaptive management. So it's learning by doing. 
whereas Indigenous knowledge is, is knowing and being. So we're already part of that system and I think that's where we, we're being missed. We're, we're not getting that opportunity to have our voice in rehabilitation of these sites. So, you know, our stories and our connections link back to the pre-development days, you know, so I suppose it's, it's, and then it's identifying those cultural species that are there, the ones that aren't there, and then also the important ones that should be there, like, you know, you know, Erin was talking about their, their Tonga species, and like, th those are, some of those species are our, I, um, our, keystone species. So, you know, if the brolga, which is a, a bird that travels around the globe, and, you know, from, from Siberia and places like that, if it's turning up at our wetlands and we're allowed to watch it dance, it does a really cool dance. Uh, if you YouTube the brolga dance, uh, the mating dance, um, and if they're turning up to our wetlands, we are happy. You know, we, are, we feel happy. We can watch it and we can mimic it in our dance. So I suppose it's... There's a long way to go in, in rehabilitation, uh, especially in the, the Australian context. If we're involved and part of that solution, then it's, it's, we, got, we feel we're going to get better outcomes for our traditional lands because, you know, and our water places, if our species are happy, our trees are happy, our country is happy, our water is happy, we are happy. Thanks, Brad. Um, we'll take a question from the room and then I've got one online here as well. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. My name is uh, George de Gooyer. Um, many things to react to. Um, I, I did a lot of work with, uh, with water management and environmental and social impact assessments. Um, and your, your topic made me, uh, reminded me of a study done by a friend of mine, Rutger Boelens, who, who studied uh, water management in South America. And uh, his PhD was called the, 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 the game, the rule, the rules of the game and the game of the rules. And, and what we're talking about is, is systems that are clashing or, 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 or trying to meet, hopefully. What you were saying, Michelle, um, about providing access, it seemed that you were also talking about environmental impact assessments, but m m maybe I'm mistaken. And I realized that there are sort of uh, overarching rule systems that can be used for that I in environmental and social impact assessment and those are used for creating uh, the possibilities for big projects to be done among other things. Um, I, I, I hear you say something that, that seems to indicate that, that there should be more space or better space for giving, uh, giving access to uh, traditional value systems and, and uh, can you explore ex expand a little bit on that and 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 because it's so difficult to meet, make systems meet uh, but how that there w might be a way there for that because there is there is a global association looking at the rules for doing doing environmental and social impact assessments by changing those and tweaking those systems you could also create a better a better channel for 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 communication between those systems and knowledge systems Excellent, thank you so much for that question. Um, yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about. Um, in an Australian context, um, which sounds like it's similar worldwide, uh, for example, when a mining company wants to build a mine, they have to do an environmental impact assessment. And what they have to put in that report is set by the state government. And they will only do what they have to do. They're not gonna go above and beyond. They're not gonna do anything extra. They're gonna do just what they have to do to meet the requirements that the government set. And the people who are assessing the applications are also very busy and, you know, they're not going to ask for anything extra. So those pieces of policy and um, requirements are just so important in setting the tone for what we require to allow these sorts of projects to go ahead. So if we can incorporate more holistic, more cultural values, shared objectives and even just better communication because the communication between mining companies and Indigenous people in terms of what is physically going to happen on their land is absolutely atrocious. There's almost um, no requirements to put it in plain language and to help them understand, even when they're negotiating agreements on, um, on native lands. Um, so yeah, thank you for the question. Did that answer your question? So this is, but this, this environmental social impact assessment, 
it is one of the tools that we can use for making this conversation in all these different domains happen. So it's, it's a moment of decision making that needs to be informed. And how do you inform it with traditional knowledge? And how do you give access to all these different aspects that we have now? Yeah, just imagine if we set the bar so much higher and said, you've got to engage people appropriately, you've got to ask them what their objectives are, you've got to give them what they need. We change the world. Thank you, great points, and Irene has got a comment on that as well. I just wanted to add from a New Zealand context that um, cultural um, impact assessments have been um, going on for quite a few years now, and what we've noticed is that they are site-specific, right? So uh, a framework that's been developed for my lake is not the same as a framework that should be developed for a lake that might be 50 kilometres up the river. They're all So the knowledge of the people at place um, informs the cultural monitoring framework that's been developed for that place. So that's just a little bit of context um, from our part of the world. So um, if we try to pick up my framework and, and apply it across the country, there'd be, there'd be a war. <laughs> so Sung, uh, the question is, how did you restore the rainwater forest? Was it using traditional techniques or did it involve new age technologies as well? So that's a specific question for you. Would you like to come up and speak to that? How did you restore your rainwater forest and, and was it using traditional techniques or did you use modern technology as well? Yeah. Uh, as uh, my English barrier, maybe I need my friend to assist me at Chino indigenous people, uh, same as me. Can I ask Sucheta to help? Maybe I will just uh, help uh, to start and Sin can also add. I think in the presentation, she have uh, mentioned a lot about the importance of the uh, forest along the, the Cock River that play a very vital role for the livelihood of the people and that how people that live along Cock River from Shan Group have uh, lived with the forest and harvest the forest in the traditional ways that sustain it for the uh, future use. But at the end of her presentation, she also uh, demonstrated about the current development model that happened, and some of those are from upstream, outside of the border in Thailand and into Burma side that is uh, quite, we can say, uh, out of control for the indigenous people to protect. So I think these are demonstrate the threat that uh, happening along the river and it called for more attention as the core message that Seng has present. This, this is, uh, but you can also add more on the initiative at the local level that um, have been done to, uh, to replenish the forest along the Kok River. Do you have a specific? Uh, yeah, so uh, actually it's a lot of things. It's a chance that uh, at I'm here, I have many things to talk, you know, but because of the, my English that I cannot explain all. So I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's no problem at all, Sung. Your presentation was very informative and perhaps over a cup of tea might be a, a better place for a conversation later. Um, are there any other questions in the room? Uh, yeah, we'll go to this gentleman. Uh, thank you so much for the beautiful session. 
so i think my question would be uh, to either uh, melika can answer or irina because they spoke about how the government is working with their communities and uh, uh, irina especially mentioned about co governance uh, while uh, um sangrewe talked about how government is not supporting them in fact yesterday in one of the sessions i think anna men showed us a video clip in which the government is completely rejecting the even the existence of indigenous people and communities so just within two uh, within these two sessions we have seen government helping the communities and government not even acknowledging the existence of communities so my question is for those countries where the government is working together with the indigenous communities how did you get the government to do that and what would be your um recommendations towards the countries where the government is not even willing to accept the existence of such communities thank you okay would any of our panelists like to have a go at that one In our, I guess in our case, um, in 1863, our tribal lands were uh, invaded and we were pushed off um, our whenua, and that was called uh, Raupatu for us. And it was a process from then, 1863, right up until 1995. So it was an intergenerational fight um, from our ancestors um, that got us to this place that we're in now. So the land was settled in 1995, and then the river settlement happened in 2000. Um, and 10, and it's a result of the work of our tūpuna or our ancestors that we're able to kind of uh, um, benefit from the work that they've done and, and kind of make our own actions moving forward. <laughs> and so that's, that's pretty much how it came about. It was a fight of our ancestors and they never gave up. Um, and now we have a settlement that's helped us. In terms of advice moving forward, I feel like it's it's quite location and site specific, so I don't wanna be sort of saying, oh, well, this is what worked for us, so it's gonna work for you guys. But it's probably more a cup of tea conversation um, that I'd be happy to have. And there's uh, other people that are working here for our tribe too that might be able to assist uh, in terms of some strategies moving forward. That's what I can say from my perspective. That's a really interesting question. Our, our country, Fiji, we've been racked by the political turmoil. We've had four military coups. And I think the, um, one of the underlying reasons for the, the government's uh, support in, in recording all this traditional knowledge is because <laughs> Itoke people have felt, their, have felt threatened uh, in, in their own country because we have a large population that was brought in by the British and uh, they took over the economy. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the political turmoil has arisen because of that threat to the indigenous sovereignty, but um, also because we've got a very rich oral history. And, you know, even in doing the research for this talk, there's very little documented. Everything is just orally passed down and so you've got to find all the older people that are fast disappearing so I think the government's aware of that that they really need to start documenting these things and so we've gone from the old-fashioned writing longhand in you know in our book of genealogy every Fijian child that is born to digitizing everything now but I might just um, I, I think that's the underlying um, reason is because of our political history Fijians native Fijians feeling threatened in their own country, that the government's trying to say, you know what, we've got this, we've got your back, we'll, we'll start um, preserving this traditional knowledge systems. And uh, they've been very proactive in the last uh, two decades or so in trying to do that. And also, credit to people, we've had some very vocal uh, Fijians that have said, you know, we've really got to preserve our, our culture and uh, they've done a, a wonderful job in raising awareness with the government bureaucracy, and I think that's where uh, things have really just started to, to snowball. Thank you. Um, I'll just, 
um, invite our other panellists if they wanted to make a comment in response to that question about any strategies for engaging with government um, before, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap it up and I'll invite Phil Duncan to the stage to make some final remarks. But firstly, I'll just give our other panellists an opportunity to comment on your experience in dealing with government. Oh, could we get this mic on over here, if that's OK, please? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, hello. Yeah, excuse me. Um, yeah, I think uh, there are another channel uh, from the online question can leave the uh, contact for me. I'm sorry that I cannot respond immediately, but I can uh, give the answer later. Give me the contact. And uh, our friend in this room, if we uh, in the coffee time, if you want interesting my presentation, we can take time and sit down and talk because uh, I hope you understand my English and I need to take time to understand. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sang. That's totally understandable. So for, perhaps for our online participant who uh, had the question for Sung, if you're able to um, perhaps pop your contact details in the chat as well, then we can connect you directly um, to facilitate a conversation later. Um, all right, so we might need to move to, to wrapping up now. Um, Phil Duncan, I will invite to the stage. So um, Phil is a proud Gomorrah man, and he is the Gullambani Professor, Professorial Fellow for the University of Canberra in Australia, and so he's going to give some final reflections. Thanks, Phil. Marabu, um, that's thank you in my language, and Marabu to uh, the panellists. Um, that was simply awesome. Um, some of you may be wondering why uh, from an Indigenous perspective from Australia. Um, I just want to add to the welcome to country. For us in Australia, it's just a modern day interpretation of an ancient custom and practice where one seeks and receives permission through, to move through lands beyond our own traditional boundaries. It's cultural protocols and it's been that well received, it, it, it cascades across all levels of government and through community. And when we came here last year um, and this year, we are so proud to have influenced um, through our established relationship with the Sami to welcome us. So I just wanted to add that. We've been taken on a journey. This is just my reflections. And I hope that you've been taken on that journey with these amazing panellists. And there's a couple of messages that I want to get into. We as Indigenous people, what you saw, they talk in the mirrors. We are bound by our cultural responsibilities and obligations. They know their country. They know their country. You know, and, and, and that cultural responsibility and obligation and the knowledge that has been down, handed down transgenerationally. Another thing that I saw was that this new ideology of systems thinking. Indigenous people think spatially, they think temporally. They think about the people upstream. They think about the obligation of place where we are or where they are but they also think about that obligation of people downstream and ensuring water um, connects, not just country, but people as well in those values. We heard about the knowledge about cultural health indicators in our systems, mirrors again. Um, so there's a couple of other things you saw, collaboration. What an amazing opportunity you've had today to be taken on a journey through a range of speakers that have invested their hearts, their souls and their culture. Not to entertain you, but to get you thinking, to challenge you to think. And I again applaud them for that. I want you to think about what I heard, and this is just me giving reflections, cultural science, is the missing ingredient. And these people have already, our panellists have clearly demonstrated a sound ability of knowing country and that cultural science is the missing ingredient in global water management and climate change. 
and our ability to be mobile and adaptable. I think the other aspect of this is that Indigenous cultural and intellectual property, the generosity of spirit of these people to share their journey, their knowledge and their commitment to being better together on this international stage, but also sharing that knowledge from a local footprint. Um, I encourage you to come with a wondering mind, to leave your preconceived positions at the door when you start talking with these people, with any Indigenous people globally, because we aspire to be the key to a brighter future and when we think about, and what other thing I've heard about is looking at the future through the eyes of our children, our next generations. And when you think about the challenges, think about your children, because that's what these people have given me today, and I hope that they've given that message to you. So, Marabu, I hope you've really uh, enjoyed being challenged. I hope you've really embraced the wonderful ray of knowledge um, and I also want to highlight that most of the panellists were women. And I think that is... But um, our two-wide scene continues, and I want to say to our moderator, um, thank you again for always being with us. Thank you for your leadership in our country, Australia. Um, and please, for those that want to come to our training session, please do. AWP, E-Water... Um, thank you for what you do with us um, uh, and, you know, walking with us. So, uh, Marabu. Thanks, Phil. And, um, yeah, sadly, we're going to have to draw to a close there. I'm sure we could talk all afternoon. But thank you all for attending. Thanks to you, um, those of you online who rejoined us after our um, short intermission. Um, and, yeah, there's another session on Indigenous Voices in Water Governance at 2 o'clock this afternoon. So if you're interested, uh, please get along to that one as well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.